Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? Uh, it's going very well. We'll see if it keeps going well with our topic today. <laughs> Let's see if it, yeah, we, are you going to rather some feathers a little bit? Hope everyone is having a great day. If this is the first time you are tuning in, make sure you check out all the content we put out on the internet. Follow me on Twitter. That's the best place to get everything that we're doing, uh, which is at Focused Compound. Uh, go to FocusedCompound.com and sign up to get access to uh, investment write-ups. And of course, we manage capital through a fund structure at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Uh, so if you're interested in that you could click that invest with us tab on the website and that will teach you all about that so in today's podcast we're going to be talking about uh, the holding company structure okay. so we could go over a few different holding companies uh, especially everyone in our pond is probably more familiar with boston omaha corporation you know there's berkshire hathaway and then uh big Lorry holdings everyone's favorite uh, uh holding company to talk about um do you are I mean do you are you interested in looking at other holding companies? I mean, when you come across them, is it something that you you always take a look at because you're interested in it? Is it something that you would ever invest in yourself? I mean, what are your general thoughts towards a uh, holding company? I do look at them because they could be mispriced, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and then also because it's a good way if you have the right person allocating capital to do smart things and um, to create value, right? Um, they're more likely to make decisions based on their ideas about shareholder value and things like that than make decisions about the what the company should be focused on, what it looks like, and, and all of those sorts of things about a company that has a narrowly defined mission. So, um, yes, I look at them. I, I mean, a lot of times I don't find them to be very cheap, or I don't like the people running it, or I'm not sure about the strategy or something like that. But there are a lot of them out there. Um, and they're, you know, they're more common in other parts of the world than the U S I'd say they're fairly rare in the U S in, in today's, uh, market mm -hmm. over time. There's been a trend towards not having conglomerates. There's been a trend towards, uh, going private and things like that. That's eliminated a lot of them. There used to be more. Mm -hmm. I mean, even Bill Ackman, right. It's, that's probably one of the reasons he's still in business today. I don't know that I've heard him speak about it before on, uh, you know, podcasts and stuff like that, how majority of the assets that he's managing now is in Pershing Square Holdings, right? right? And the benefit you get of that is you have the permanent capital base where if you're a hedge fund, uh, obviously you could have potential redemptions and, and capital outflows. Sure. And Icon has a vehicle too. Yeah, Icon, mm -hmm. um, IEP. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's some uh, investment uh, value investors who would have been basically left the business or whatever because there was too many redemptions in today in the last couple of years and also uh, like 20 years ago or so it happened both times yeah mm -hmm. uh so boston omaha corporation i mean so i guess we don't need to give like your actual opinions on the companies themselves but i'm just curious here so like when you start to analyze a holding company i mean where do your eyes first go is it figuring out what they're doing do you spend a lot more time learning about the ceo and the corporate culture i mean what are your thoughts towards that I mean, are you biased towards, let's say, um, maybe, uh, you know, the way that the compensation structure works? Like, is it like a hedge fund that's, they're paid fees similar to, uh, you know, in a hedge fund structure, but actually in a holding company structure? I mean, what are your thoughts towards that? So uh, is it, is there a lot of excitement about it or not? Any excitement? Is it overlooked or not? Um, is it very cheap looking, the assets that it has compared to the public company value? Uh, those sorts of immediate ideas that you're looking at it, just like you would if you were looking at a company that owned a lot of land or other assets. So that's the first thing I would look at. So some would show up to me as saying, no, the all signs point to a lot of excitement relative to the substance of it, which is Boston, Omaha, as opposed to other ones like Big Lari hated. So more likely that it might be undervalued. And then other ones that are complex or that are overlooked by other people. Um, there's actually one in around here that was built up um, over time by like a corporate raider type. He died. It still exists. And so you can still see the structure of each of the companies that he owned. And I think there's fairly low understanding of that company. So that's a good example. It doesn't always trade in line with what you'd expect. There's lots of things in other countries that, that are that way. Are there a bunch of public companies in there that are smaller the one that you're just talking about? Or is it just one holding company? No, it's, uh, let's see. Like they own majority of the the, the holding company there would like be large positions and there'd be three or four. So you'd have yeah. Compex, 
yeah okay. you'd have uh chronos yeah i've come across that uh and then the main holding company there would be how do you say val he mm -hmm, something like that yeah um that one would be much more interesting than many of the ones like these sorts of ones because you can evaluate each part of it um in terms of other public company things and in terms of peers that you could find and all of that uh and that some of these things can be accidental that way about how they're built up mm -hmm. like i said i think that that one is because someone died um there's other ones though in other countries that are more family reasons and stuff like that sometimes i don't like the generation that's like still around though so there was someone who did a lot of value creating things and then they died or something and now the people who inherited it aren't really great investors uh big Lari holdings somebody mm -hmm. actually tweeted to me asking if we were going to go to the annual meeting and to ask questions for him <laughs> Yeah, so he was we overseas, didn't go. he can't do it. Yeah, so I guess they do the annual meeting in San Antonio now, right? Is mm -hmm. that right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, uh, they used to do it, like, I, did they used to do it in New York like everyone else did? I, I'm not sure. The, I mean, since I've been following the company, it's been San Antonio. I think it's only been two years, though. Okay. Yeah, because his he's connected to it, so it makes more sense for him to do it. I think they took advantage of COVID to do that, basically, and then decided to stick with it. Yeah, I've read all the annual letters that he does. Mm-hmm. I mean, I followed him for a long time because I think I first wrote about him on a blog or something close to 15 years ago. You kind of have a variant view, it seems like, from the consensus I read on Corner Berkshire of Big Lari, it seems like. Would you say that's true? Well, they hate him? Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't like or hate people as part of my assessment of them, so um, that part's a separate issue. They also think that he's made a lot of mistakes and destroyed a lot of value and things like that, probably. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that he's done hasn't been that successful, but other ones are just not reflecting the market price. Uh, a bunch of them do make a lot of sense. They've acquired some pretty good insurance companies. I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. They, and I also think he's a pretty good restaurant investor. So um, I've always thought he was a pretty good restaurant investor. Steak yeah. and Shake. Um, but when else? he invested in Friendlies before their bankruptcy, Cracker Barrel is there. Is there was their big position recently? Um, yeah, yeah. People, but he has a compensation structure that's complicated, and through ownership of, uh, through the fact that he owns a lot of stock in this company through a hedge fund, and then through the way that they restructured the compensation of Big Larry Holdings itself, it's as if he's getting paid a hedge fund structure type thing on it. So it's similar to the kind of payment that we would have. But instead of being in a, in a hedge fund, it's a permanent capital situation. So it's much like a publicly traded hedge fund. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious. I mean, what about like closed end funds? Do you ever come across any interesting ones? Generally not because they don't attract... Um, people who are very good investors and stuff because you can't really make a lot of money doing it. Closed-end funds are better than open-end funds. I mean, in all ways, they're a better vehicle and stuff, but they're not better, they're not easier to sell. Because Munger was very big in closed-end funds when he was investing yeah, in his the partnership. the money was in open-end and now it's in ETFs. Yeah. So they're going to worse and worse uh, yeah, structures yeah. in terms of um, size and liquidity and stuff like that. But yeah, no, I mean, uh, there have been good closed end funds. You can, f I do search for closed end funds. I think that it, I've talked to people before about them. I think if you're going to want diversification like a mutual fund, you should do it through a closed end fund. Many are bad um, in terms of who they attract because it has to, in some cases, the reason why there's a big discount and stuff is because of how little people like management and that management refuses to close it down. We've talked about some closed end funds off the podcast that I pointed out, including some that are controlled by the same people basically. And they're not of sufficient size, but they don't shut them down. I mean, there's some, there's closed end funds that are significantly smaller than our hedge fund. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't shut them down and they have two high expenses, much higher expenses than our fund. And um, they collect a lot of that money over time and they, they don't think they can raise more assets but they still are able to pay themselves a pretty good amount and they have no interest in in getting good performance really so it's just a question of whether they can take get market type returns and sometimes they're much worse than market returns but with very high expenses it doesn't perform well mm -hmm. um but there are closed-in funds that trade at big discounts sometimes uh i mean a strategy of focusing on just investing closed-in funds would probably make sense the logical thing would be to look for countries that you want to invest in and then buy into the closed end funds because what tends to happen is a double discount and a double premium. So when a market gets overvalued, the closed end funds get even more overvalued relative to the underlying positions. 
And on the reverse, when a market gets undervalued, they get even more undervalued as people flee the closed end fund. Because remember that most people in the closed end fund for a country fund are going to be foreigners who are investing in it. And so they're the, they're the um, most skittish money. And so they're going to get out of it whenever there's a concern. So if there's, you know, an election that goes bad in Latin America or Turkey or wherever, um, that is the moment where the closed end fund is probably going to have everyone from America and Europe and stuff sell out. And at that moment would be a good time to buy, you know. So if you have countries that you like, investing through a closed end fund would make a lot of sense. And, you, you know, Japan, like people ask you to pick net nets or whatever. Most people aren't going to do that they might be willing to do a close end fund of a smaller funds or more domestic focused funds and things like that to avoid ownership of the big funds. Cause you don't want to invest in like an index for Japan because it's all the big export oriented firms, which are often aren't as cheap and not as good. So yeah, it's a, it's a way I think close in funds to, um, in, to use instead of indexes, you know, it's more attractive that way. Ben Graham did some of it in his later years. I'm sure. Um, I think I mentioned, uh, a man for all markets, Thorpe, mm -hmm. same sort of thing. It's a pretty sure way of, of improving your returns. There's little reason not to do it. Um, because if you think about the average index, the average open end fund, they're, they're, they're no different than the market in terms of a likely skill. Uh, holding companies are different because you're going to get a result that's very different from the stock market, better or worse, depending on who you're investing with and what they're focused on. But if we're talking about like mutual funds, then yeah, looking for closed end funds at big discounts can help improve your your chances of good returns. Munger would talk about it, how he, you know, because of the way you have to do mark to market accounting for your hedge fund, he would know that he would invest in these closed end funds that were very undervalued, but he had to market at the market price and it would, it, that was reflected in his let, performance as and well. And people could pull money out of his fund. Mm -hmm. So that was a problem. Yeah, so he was invested in like source capital or whatever it was called at the time. And um, you'd have to market to market. So yeah, you and that you can see that in some of these, in some companies, they carry thing at val they carry stocks at values which are already cheap. Um, a lot of these unwind eventually. Like there was Pargeza in um, technically Switzerland, I guess, in Europe, which eventually was undone. But that was a deal through um, GBL there, which is a Belgian company, and. Um, that sometimes had that complexity where you could see what stocks they owned. And sometimes those stocks were cheap. Sometimes they weren't. But if you looked and said, oh, that portfolio looks pretty good. It looks pretty cheap right now. It might have been a better uh, approach to buy into the holding company for that portfolio when it was trading at two thirds or so of net asset value, because you're really just buying big European blue chip companies, but you're getting them at two thirds uh, at two thirds of the price of buying them in the open market. So mm -hmm. that's a way to, that would have been a way to buy like Adidas and things like that. Could you like buy the close in fund and go and like short the other companies? Sure. Well, the other companies are very easy to short. They're mm -hmm. huge companies mostly. In a perfect world, you, uh, in a fund structure, you buy up the close in fund and you liquidate all the positions, right? Like right. you use that as your vehicle. But I mean, so many of them have poison pills. Yeah. So, um, with where well, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. The, I mean, that's otherwise they wouldn't exist. You know, it's like the efficient market, uh, the $20 bill lying on the ground. Well, it can't be $20 bill because someone would have already picked it up. <laughs> we talk about that all the time. It, it, it can't be with these funds because otherwise someone would have already raided them when they're smaller funds that way. Um, that's why they look that way. It's mm -hmm. because usually because of family control of those things. Not, I mean, sometimes not always. Sometimes the holding company just is doing perfectly well and isn't being reflected in the market. You know, Berkshire Hathaway, first five years, you can look, uh, doing great things and not reflected in the market value at all. Um, it really depends on what people are interested in and what they want to, how they see the vehicle, I guess. I think that's my biggest concern. Um, so for instance, in the example I was giving with Pargeza, um, People could do that, and I'm sure they was written up on Value Investors Club or something, short this stock and buy this. I think that's not a good strategy long term in terms of when I'm thinking about, about what the cost would be, how likely it would be to actually close that gap without an event happening, and things like that it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. However, if you do think about it, um, simply buying at a discount with the idea that either 
if you buy at the widest discount it's ever been at, let's say, or, or one of the widest discounts. So if it's normally traded at a discount of seven, uh, you know, 70 to 80 percent of net asset value, and you find it on day where it's at 58 percent, you might get the advantage that it closes over time, and then you sell out just buying the probabilities. But there's also always a chance that they'll unwind the structure, and that you'll make money that way. Mm -hmm. So if you like the underlying businesses, it makes sense to take that risk and do it. Most people are unwilling to do that. And so it's kind of like when I mentioned the merger arbitrage stuff with like uh, Cambria. And I said it looks like an attractive one to me. The reason why it looks attractive is this a certain degree of uncertainty, but cheapness. So people often prefer deals where there's a high degree of certainty on what the price will be and when it will happen. And same thing with like shorting and buying something that's underlying it to hedge it out. They like that kind of arbitrage that they have. But the gain on that is usually so small and the risk, if anything goes bad, is pretty high. Whereas just buying something that's genuinely cheap with some more upside potential can be attractive, but you can't prove to yourself uh, logically that it has to work out. You're just giving yourself a better chance. And that's what I'm saying with the closing and funds. A lot of people avoid them because there's no way to prove that it will work out better. But on average, if you buy closed end funds at discounts, as opposed to buying open end funds, you're just giving yourself a better chance over time to do even better. Would you structure it similar to like a net net portfolio where you just pick 10, for example? I mean, I wouldn't do it, but if I had to invest in mutual funds, I would never buy anything but closed end funds. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing to buy would be things that are already trading at a discount. There's no reason when things are trading at a discount not to buy them. Um, in each case, there might be some arguments about why you should buy the, you shouldn't buy certain closed end funds, and I would agree with that. I mean, some of them are complicated. I've seen ones where there's big discounts that people won't buy because they have embedded tax issues. So when they sell the stock to liquidate, um, they would have the um, capital gain. However, it's similar to Berkshire that way, which I feel people miscalculate. If you do the math as if they're liquidating today, you always end up with a situation in which you vastly underestimate the long-term net asset value of it over time because it's very unlikely Berkshire is going to sell off shares of Coke in any given year. And so there have been closed end funds that have existed for decades and decades without selling a position. And remember, they have permanent capital. So mm -hmm. there's no need for uh, flows out of the fund or something to sell the position. So if they've owned Intel since the IPO, why are you assuming a liquidation analysis that they're going to sell Intel this year? more likely you should assume that they're going to keep this position and you're going to get, if you think Intel will go up 7% a year, then your return is going to be that much each year without paying additional taxes on it. Mm -hmm. You know, But people are scared of it, and so it keeps them away from it. So how much of your time would be spent on the actual companies that they own on the close end fund? Oh, none. I mean, because mm -hmm. it's just... I mean, there are some companies that, like, with Pargeza, they were not uh, very diversified. With a closed-end fund, you just look at it and compare it to another mutual fund that way. So, like, a country fund or something. Like what I was saying with Japan, you can find closed-end funds in Japan, which basically are the equivalent of a small-cap Japanese fund. And so you just say, I'm getting small-cap Japanese stocks, mm -hmm. you know? I wonder if that would be a, a good screen. You run a screen on closed-end funds that are trading at, let's say, half a book or something like that. Or net asset value. Yeah. I mean, it's very rare for things to trade at discounts as big as that because there's usually stuff that's very wrong with them. Mm. But if you're thinking about a, here's the thing with the, the country ones, for instance, it's not out of the question that you'll have something trading at 85% of net asset value in one country and 115% in another country. And that's a really um, big gap, right? In terms of popularity. And you can look at them for things. Uh, I think Value Line has some closed end funds that they cover. Some other websites might do it. You can see over time, Morningstar, um, that say Korea or something. Uh, now it's so long ago that pro probably you can't figure this out. But Korea was actually very popular before it had a, a crash of its stock market. And then Buffett invested and things like that. So you can see that Korean um, country funds, closed end funds, actually traded at premium when their market was overvalued. And then when their market went down to single digit PEs, then it traded at a discount. So you could get a you know discount into something that has already very low PEs. Mm -hmm. So the most hated markets often are going to have additional discounts for you. So it, it's kind of like having leverage without having the risks of leverage to mm -hmm. it. You know, you're just getting leverage by being cheaper. We talked about that with Berkshire Hathaway. Um, how much did it? Buffett says it was a mistake to buy Berkshire. Maybe 
but it still shows up in the returns over different periods we've looked at. A major part of the returns are that he went from something that was a discount to book value to selling at a premium to book value. It did help his returns that he was buying something cheap and as his vehicle and not buying something at book value. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the most interesting thing about Berkshire, in my opinion, is the fact that the stock went nowhere over five years. And it'd be so hard to hold that as a shareholder, probably. Assume if you, let's say, like when we've talked about many times, mm-hmm. let's say you're with the partnership and then he writes you the letter saying, I'm, you know, I'm wealthier, I'm less motivated. Um, this is what I'm doing with my money, but you should, you know, do what you want to do. And then you invest in Berkshire Hathaway and then you wait five years. And we always talk about it. Five years sounds like five minutes when you're listening to it on the podcast, but five years is a very long time. Yeah, I think Big Larry Holdings has gone, what is it, gone nowhere for 10 years or something now? Yeah, let's look at it. People ask all the time, is he the next Buffett? Uh, yes, yeah, so the mean, market personality is very different than Buffett. <laughs> I think his approach in some ways is different from Buffett too. 2011, they had a $364 million market cap, and uh, now the market cap as of the end of 2020 was $345 million. Yeah, yes, however, right. a lot of that is a market. So if you look at per share, can we look at per share? So does it have per share information for, let's see. Um, book value. Yeah. So tangible book value, you have the number at the bottom? Yeah. It's gone from $201 to $157. Okay. And what did the market cap go from? Market cap went from $364 million to $345. let us see what it is today. $506 million today. Is that $506 million today? Yeah. Okay. So I think they do that by the end of 2020. I think that's how quick FS calculates it. So what does it say the stock price is at? Stock price today. I'm not sure if these values are $164. Cor- I don't know if these values are correctly calculated because there's a complication in the structure of the company where it owns shares in itself. So I would be skeptical if QuickFS has the right information. $511 million. Yeah. The market cap information will be correct, but I don't know about the book value information. You have to read the filings yourself to figure that out. Um, Did he basically just take over this company and do like a like a reverse merger into the, do you know the origins of this company this company stake and shake i know it's stake and shake oh so it was just him taking over stake and shake correct and then he, renaming it Biglari holdings right so so he owned western sizzlin which is now part of this company too um so it's similar to berkshire that way it's a combination of multiple companies in which he had invested uh so in i mean berkshire's a little different because buffett unwound his fund but Putting that aside, it's very similar. You have in different ways a combination of the Lion Fund, Stake and Shake, and Western Sizzlin. So it's a combination of different investments that he was in, that he was controlling. Um, Stake and Shake obviously has had lots of problems. The thing with Big Larry Holdings recently is that they decided to bail out Stake and Shake even though the debt was non-recourse to them. So that's a decision that he thinks probably that he could turn around Stake and Shake. He did turn around originally when he took over the company. Um, and had a lot of success with it, huge same store sales growth, uh, complete change in profitability. And then it's had several years of really bad results lately, losing money. And then um, the company chose to pay the, to um, pay debts that were owed by Stake and Shake, but not by Big Larry Holdings. So that decision means that they have the upside of Stake and Shake, but not that they chose to walk away from it and allow it to uh, not have any protection from the parent here. And haven't they been shifting more towards a franchise model as well? Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. It, the, it, sort of a franchise model. It's a franchise model that'd be closer to like Chick-fil-A than to some other companies actually. But, um, it, you know, and they have an idea that they think that that'll work out. All these food companies always say that they're going to shift to... Mm -hmm. to franchise things you know capital light model yeah but they have done it already they've shifted some things to it sure yeah i I don't i don't particularly like steak and shake as a um uh, it's competitive position right and so that that would be a concern for me it has a lot of upside i mean if you look at its sales and all that so there's a lot of upside in big large holdings if it turns things around there's huge upside but um I, I don't like Steak and Shake's competitive position versus, you know, Wendy's, Burger King, McDonald's, all of those sorts of things so much. And I think that that's difficult for a company this size. Um, it's it's just a tough industry and tough position that they're in. Not very differentiated, yeah. The very Eno Steak and Shake? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They changed a lot of things. Mm-hmm. So they lowered their prices a lot, lowered certain things I would say about like quality and portion sizes and things like that to focus on very cheap, drive up store traffic, um yeah 
But I mean, those aren't the most important things. I mean, I think the quality of Steak and Shake is a lot higher than McDonald's, but I think McDonald's will have more success than Steak and Shake, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, for everybody listening, you should watch the series Food That Built America, and they have one on, you know, McDonald's and Burger King. But the first season, they talk about, like, mainly candy and stuff like that, and okay. Heinz, and it's pretty cool, but they talked about McDonald's and Burger King, so I guess that's kind of relatable to Biglari Holdings. Yeah, Biglari is impossible to annualize from the quick FS stuff. Uh, you have to read the filings to understand it. Uh, it o- owns a variety of different things. It owns Maxim. Uh, it owns um, a couple insurance companies, uh, sort of specialty property and casualty stuff. Um, it owns a uh, oil and gas related business, which I don't know if they'll be producing much of any earnings in this year with, with COVID and stuff and what's happened because they're kind of somewhat marginal in that. I don't think that in a bad year for oil, they would really be profitable. But um, they own a lot of different stuff. And then they also had their position in Cracker Barrel, which is very important to the investment. So it's you have to just read the letters that he puts out and read the 10K to understand the different parts of it and then break down sort of a sum of the parts of what you think it's worth and evaluate it that way. Mm, but you think it has, if they turn things around, massive upside? Uh, sure. I mean, you can... I mean, that's obvious because the market cap is very low versus just like what steak and shake is as a business, mm-hmm. what the system is. I don't know that they will turn around though. I wouldn't necessarily want to bet on that. Um, I mean, if you, you can see in his letter, he talks about it and stuff. They've had huge same store sales declines in the last few years from steak and shake huge. Um, so massive market share loss. And, uh, but they had that once before, before he took over. I would say, why do you think that is? I mean, it's not like this is a, a I mean, this is more of a mature concept, right? What happened within the past couple of years to erode the competitive know. positioning I would say shift like in positioning. So I think a major factor was a shift in positioning and, but he would disagree with that. But I think that initially to take more share and to get more people coming to your, um, stores, what you did is you gave them a lot of value for the amount of money they were spending which is focusing on like a very low budget menu, uh, very cheap items, like saying here are items that you can get for $4 or less or something, I think is a lot of what they did. And um, you can get people in to do that. Traffic went up a lot while the average ticket size went down at first. People liked that and thought it was a big success. But obviously you attracted, I mean, that means that your average person, uh, your business is becoming more more and more um, about people who are fairly recent converts to you and who aren't necessarily going all that frequently and aren't spending that much. And then other things came in that competed with it. And then I, th- I think some quality lowering stuff. They had some ideas and some people make fun of it and stuff. Like I think Corner Berkshire and Fairfax, they make fun of the um, idea of doing like um, better machines for their shakes. Mm-hmm. I think that would be a very important thing to focus on. Uh, that was an idea that I thought was very good and would make a lot of sense. You have to differentiate your business that way. They have to sell their stuff they can make a lot of money on. That kind of thing makes a lot of sense. McDonald's did that with coffee. They invested a lot in improving their coffee situation, and that was important to them. That happens a lot of times where you need to invest in those sorts of things. If you don't, you'll fall behind others that way. If you're already going with, if you're trying to cut costs, it could be lower quality meat, smaller portions and things. Your place is called Steak and Shake. Um, they also have the weird thing that they have service inside, right? And they're basically cutting that down and getting rid of that over time. Um, to focus on being a drive through business. I think that was also part of it. They became more competitive on that. Um, some people in a lot of the country may not even know that much about Steak and Shake because it's more of a middle of the country phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I only had it growing up. Well, because it's, where did in it Midwest, start? Illinois. It started in Indiana? I think it was actually Illinois, right? Was it? Okay. Found in normal Illinois. There yeah. you go. 1934. What about Boston, Omaha? Are you generally a fan of the structure, though, as opposed to a hedge fund? Um, not really. Why? Uh, I mean, I'm not really a fan of it because, I mean, there, there's no, I, I don't know what the purpose of it is of having a holding company. So why would you have a holding company to make investments instead of having a hedge fund? Uh, in the example of like Big Larry Holdings, the issue there is that he's having to restructure a public company to take the kinds of fees that he would take at a hedge fund. Mm-hmm. It's also complicated by the fact that he still has a hedge fund. In theory, if you ha- could get investors to fold into a, 
a fund and fold into a corporately trade uh, publicly traded corporation instead of a fund. I mean, I guess that gives some benefit to the manager of it, uh, but I'm not really that sure what it does. It, it seems inefficient to me generally. Everybody listening would think the you know they're thinking probably about the permanent capital that you get from it. Yeah, which is an enormous advantage. Yeah, you got manager. permanent capital from it, but your own money is permanent capital. So it's, I mean, the issue here is like, what are you doing? You're you're raising permanent capital from investors. I guess the argument would be, well, the investors can buy and sell among themselves, mm-hmm. sort of like having a mutual fund that way, um, except that it could be at a discount. So it's like a closed-end fund. Yeah. So the idea that a corporation is sort of like a closed-end fund that way. Um, I think the idea of marrying operating businesses with investments makes a lot of sense. Yeah. No, I think that makes a ton of sense. And a lot of businesses would benefit if they thought like Berkshire does, where instead of buying entire businesses and stuff, they invested in the stock market, you know? Um, Some do sometimes. I mean, if you notice, NACO did make a very small investment in a stock because they said it's the same thing as what we're going to do anyway by buying Mm -hmm. um, royalty, uh, uh, you know, oil and gas royalty stuff, uh, buying actual acreage. So most companies wouldn't do that. It would make sense if they thought that way, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah. So, I mean, if you're a bank, does is it easier to buy shares in another bank that you like than to acquire a bank and pay a premium and stuff? Yeah. You, the results that you get as an investment are better. But as a structure, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think it worked for Berkshire. Um, I don't know who else it's really worked for as well. I know that people talk about it a lot. It gets a lot of... Uh, interest from people, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, and Boston Omaha is one of them, and uh, I guess uh, Ackman also. People are interested in that, but the line between like a closed end fund and a holding company are is another issue there. Mm-hmm. Well, David Einhorn had his own reinsurance company. Yeah, so that was a I've public that. Co. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's still publicly traded, uh, right? GLRE. They've changed their strategy though, so. How so? Uh, I would say that they, their original, yeah, and and what was it? Third point had the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I like that approach. That you, I ideas to raise money through a reinsurance uh, to be able to have money to invest, and I certainly don't like it in a hedge fund. I mean, I think, I mean, they're actual hedge funds like. Einhorn shorts and stuff. I think that's really stupid for a reinsurer. It, it doesn't make any sense to me if you're writing long tail business and stuff like that, why you would want to smooth out your returns. But that's kind of like, I think that's dumb for colleges. You have the longest term thinking horizon of anyone. If you're some big, um, uh, you know, if you're a foundation or an you're endowment. an endowment or something, and yet you're doing things that are focused on more like smoothing out returns instead of having very bumpy returns the way that Berkshire Hathaway does it. It's like you have the benefit of the long term horizon in there. Yeah, I mean, out. as a reinsurer, it would make sense often to own large positions in companies for the long term. Look, they use blue chip stamps, uh, the float from that to buy C's. That makes more sense, you know. Um, technically, uh, I believe that the um, uh, railroad, Burlington Northern, is owned by an insurance company in Berkshire. I don't think that they bought it by the holding company directly. So same sort of thing, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the the problem with those is the reinsurance business. I don't know that the economics of the reinsurance business are that great. But it does help raise money and stuff, probably, and you're connecting to a famous person that way. It You know, it has all the concerns that i would have normally about that that it's a lot of um i'm always concerned when it's about the personality right people are investing in it because of the person and you can see how badly that goes if people then turn on that person which happened like with with big Larry. um and that does typically happen i mean if your performance isn't good for a while then you'll have a lot of people go negative on you and all that sort mm-hmm. of thing yeah got it cool well thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us here today if you're watching us on youtube hit that subscribe button wherever you are listening to us on whatever podcast app make sure hit that subscribe button as well a rating and review goes a very long way for jeff and myself 300 plus episodes um so if uh, you want to help us out in any way a rating or review is a great way to do that i want to thank everybody so much for tuning in and we will see you in the next podcast